Hi, and welcome to the Naturalist Podcast. I'm C. McKeon. And I'm Lev Fred. And we are going to be discussing what is going on in the natural world outside of your front door and around the globe. Hello and welcome back to the Naturalist Podcast, or the Naturalist Cast, seeing as we're now on video. Um, Today, I have with me my co-host, Lev. Hi, Lev. Hello, that's me. Hi, C. How's it going? Good. And we have a special guest. Maggie Galbraith has joined us from Australia. Welcome, Maggie. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, C. Thanks, Lev. Thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Um, The way we start this off, Maggie, is generally by asking the question of what is going on outside of your front door? Well, um, okay, so obviously I'm in Australia, so our seasons are kind of back to front to yours. So we're in winter at the moment. And from, you know, listening from previous podcasts, I think you guys in winter, you're pretty quiet. Here, it's sort of the opposite. So if you think about it, you know, our summers and all that are very hot, very unpleasant. I mean, you guys would have seen the bushfires and what was going on with that. So that's not that unusual here, although that was a, a little bit over the top. Um, so a lot of our, f- our flowering plants and trees, especially things like banksias, grevilleas, they tend to come into flower in autumn. And that of course means all the birds and a lot of the insects and all that sort of, the things you would expect to see in spring tends to happen in our autumn. So at the moment, I mean, at the moment, it's pitch dark outside because it's 10 p.m. Uh, So there's not too much out there. Um, But at the moment, we've, uh, all those blooms are sort of calmed down now. But we have got an awful lot of cockatoos, rainbow lorikeets, ravens. We have got numerous species of honey eaters just all over the place and I get so jealous with you guys because you talk about these beautiful birds that have these gorgeous melodic songs and I don't know if you've ever heard a wattle bird (laughs) but oh my god it sounds like someone strangling somebody (laughs) it's just the most amazing sound and they're very uh temperamental so they like to chase each other around and yell at cats and yell at people. And it's, uh, yeah, we, we don't get a peaceful morning chorus here. <laughs> Put it that way. You know, I'm sure you've heard cockatoos. So, you know, we get that and we get, um, oh, we've got an awful lot of rainbow lorikeets around at the moment in the suburbs, like insane. We've got squadrons of them. I call them squadrons because they're, they're mad (laughs) and they've got like a very piercing sort of thing. So you've got, you know, the beautiful magpie warbling along and then two seconds later, you've got wattle birds screaming at you and you've got rainbow lorikeets screaming at you and a cockatoo will, you know, or 30 will fly overhead and they're screaming. It's, it's an exciting time to be alive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, good. (laughs) That's excellent. So I'm not sure that folks listening will know what a honey bird is. Okay. So we've got a couple, we call them honey eaters. So that's, it's like a collective term, but really what we should be calling them is wattle birds. So we've got little wattle birds, which are adorable. They're very sort of drab looking sort of brown speckles sort of things about the size of a blackbird roughly. Okay. They are super game. They are not afraid of anything. And they're, they're very common and they're very acrobatic and they're all over the place. Um, we also get red wattle birds, which are a fair bit bigger. Um, they're sort of more like a, like a pigeon that's worked out type <laughs> size. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all over the, the place at the moment. So, um, and there's also New Holland honey eaters. And they're, they're pretty much my favorites. They're, they are adorable little things. They're, they're pretty small and svelte, and they honestly look like they're constantly coming down off a sugar high, and they're really upset about it. <laughs> they're just, 
they're really wired. They're, I love them. They're great. They've got like these streaks of yellow and black. And because their eyes are quite large for a bird their size, but the pupil's really small, they honestly, they look a little bit left of center. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the way they act, like seriously, the way they act, like I'm very lucky. I live near a fantastic place called the Cranbourne Botanic Gardens, which is just magic. And they nest there and it's, it's a heavily utilized botanic gardens. There's some, you know, very sort of structured gardens. There's a, there's the Australia garden as well, which is um, just beautiful. It's made to look like the desert, like the outback, like what I guess you guys would, expect Australia to look like. Uh, and then there's just a whole bunch of the natural shrub and trees that have always grown here. And you get these little New Holland honey eaters there and through the suburbs. And they care so little about us. I've walked along just, you know, taking photos and whatever, and these guys will be fighting in midair. And I've had them literally slam into my chest. Wow. wow. Because they, <laughs> yeah. That's wild. But, yeah, they're, they're pretty cool little things. I so, love it. So we get a lot of them at the moment. We introduced you as being in Australia, but Australia is a huge place and um, it's a continent unto itself. So where oh, yeah. in Australia are you? So I'm in Victoria, okay. which if you sort of look at Australia, I'm sort of down the bottom, um, just above Tasmania, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so um, we don't get, like we get very warm here but where i'm not tropical right. i'm i would call this more sort of temperate okay. so for instance it's it's winter here at the moment um we've just had our first frosts mm -hmm. and like we don't get snow this close to like this level of sea level right um we do get snow up in the high country which is sort of your very typical man from snowy river sort of you know imagery um yeah, so we get, but here we just get a lot of rain, thankfully, okay. and really cold. And how close so, to you are the coast? I'm very close. I am about 15 minutes drive um, on a good day. So here we basically, this is the thing about Australians. Here, here's something a lot of people don't know. We don't go by distance. We go by time of driving. Okay. <laughs> it's like in Canada. It's Yeah. 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 Oh, you guys are like our cousins, yeah. seriously. Yeah, we, we, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm about 15 minutes away. So I frequently go down. I've got a little beach, um, fairly, fairly well utilized beach as well in the suburbs called Carrum not too far from me and Seaford and I head down that way as often as I can and you know go beach combing and watch the gannets and you know oh that's right the... you have Australian gannets oh yeah oh yeah, what a yeah. magnificent bird they are beautiful little things well, not little they're, they're pretty big <laughs> but yeah they're quite large yeah so, so yeah. how cold is very cold maggie like what what would be like a very cold day okay so very cold for us here where where i am in the southeastern suburbs it's a little bit warmer so we don't get too far below zero centigrade but okay. it's it's not that uncommon um sort of further yeah. on the other side of the bay and going inland where it starts getting a little bit colder, like the high country. I think they had minus three oh, yesterday. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of people don't think about it. Like they think we're all, you know, walking around in, really yeah. Yeah, in sandals yeah. and terry toweling shorts and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, no, you'll freeze. It gets yeah. pretty cold here. I mean, it's nothing, uh, when you think about Tasmania, that's, that's cold. That is freezing <laughs> yeah. over there. I've got a couple of extremely good friends of mine who live down there and I get to, you know, fly down there and crash on their couch every now and again. And, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's cold. <laughs> that is, oh yeah. I mean, I've been, I went to um, Canada a few years ago and we went in the start of autumn. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you got you guys get proper cold. <laughs> we do, we do, we do get cold. Yeah, we we do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I mean, always... for that. Sorry, oh. so you go on. 
I was just going to say, I've always wanted to go to South Australia and Tasmania for, to see the, the sea dragons. And oh. the, you have a tremendous, what I would call a crayfish um, in, in some of the streams down there. Just, I mean, the, the diversity of life in Australia is something that I am, I, I've just always wanted to explore. So I'm really pleased to have you with us and telling us about where you live. It's exciting. Oh, yeah. Well, if you like um, leafy sea dragons, not, not terribly far from where I live, there's a place called Hastings and there's a little pier there. And I used to scuba dive. And th this is the cool thing with leafy sea dragons. They're really not bright. They're, they're beautiful, but they're, they're, they're not clever. You go down on Hastings and you sort of swim out along the pier. There's, there's not much point going out in a boat, you know, and it's quite exposed water. And you've got these big uh, kelp beds, lots of seaweed and stuff like that, which is just a smorgasbord of wildlife. It's, you know, you get rays, you get uh, seahorses. Occasionally you get penguins and dolphins and sharks and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you get these leafy sea dragons. Uh, I remember one of my last dives I did, I'm just swimming in amongst, you know, all this beautiful greenery and it's all lovely. It's beautiful. And leafy sea dragon comes out. And I guess he saw his reflection in my mask and proceeded to attack my mask. <laughs> oh, <that's> <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> now, here's this little fluttery, gorgeous little fish. You know, here I am. I'm like, 500 times his size. He doesn't care about me. He cares about that reflection and he's going to take it on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What an experience. Yeah. yeah they're, they're great. They, they're wonderful little things. And the seahorses are awesome. Like they don't, they're not like, you know, the amazing stuff like you get in Korea or whatever. They're, they're, they're sort of plain Brown, but if you run your finger really gently along their tummy, they have this tendency to curl around your fingers Oh, and yeah. it's like, it's a bit of an Australian scuba diver thing. You just swim around with seahorses. <laughs> <laughs> you just do. <laughs> just wow. cute. So when, when we're thinking of Australia in winter and or your part of Australia in winter, are, <laughs> and I know you said that there's no snow, but I have a hard time adjusting to, to the idea even of kangaroos in in cold climates and like your your kind of stereotypical Australian wildlife in cold climates. So do you have kangaroos and koalas and that sort of thing in your neighborhood? So not so much koalas. Koalas, they used to be around here a lot. Um, unfortunately, we got urban growth, which, you know, uh, unfortunately puts a bit too much pressure to sustain populations. So koalas are a little bit further away from me. I can drive down to a place called Phillip Island, which is probably about uh, maybe about an hour and a half's drive where there's a koala sort of area. Mm -hmm. And they're all over the place there. They're not hard to find. I actually went, there's a wonderful place um, on the other side of the bay from where I am. So if you imagine Melbourne, we're sort of shaped like this. That's our bay. I live over here. This is the city. On this side of the bay, there's this wonderful place called the Great Ocean Road. And that, that's magic, that place. There's um, incredible whale watching and there's a, a few nature reserves there, which are just fantastic. I actually went there and there was koalas just everywhere. And again, they don't really care too much about people. And this koala, I was just sitting there watching an emu because, you know, it's an emu. They're kind of cool. <laughs> and um, this koala just came out of nowhere in the undergrowth and comes out, looks at me, sort of, you know, checks me out. It's koalas sort of tend to do it. They've got really cool eyes too. They, they don't look like you think they look. They look like cat's eyes. They're funky. Ah. And he, he was checking me out and I'm like, you know, hi, g'day, how you doing? <laughs> sort of thing. And he sort of went, oh, well, you've spoken to me. I have to run away. And they've actually got quite a turn of speed on them. And he bolted off and he was actually jumping over fallen branches and then he climbed up the tree to my perfect head height. So I'm a naturalist. I walk over to say hi. <laughs> and he's just, you know, he's looking at me like, can, can I help you? Sort of thing. So, you know, yeah, we got koalas and kangaroos actually do really well uh, in cold weather. Ah. Do really, really well. Yeah. You see them up there 
uh, in the high country in the snow, they'll just be grazing on what they can find. They wow. don't mind. And you get wallabies and wombats and echidnas, not so much. They don't like the snow as much. I mean, see how low they are to the ground. I can understand that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, but yeah, they they do really well up there. They, they have no issues. Our wildlife's pretty adaptable. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Oh, how about platypus? Yeah. Oh, I knew you were going to ask me about that. That is my, that's my unicorn. I, I've <laughs> never been able to find one in the wild. They are so difficult to find. Like, like I mean, obviously everyone knows what a platypus looks like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, but the only way I can describe it to you is imagine an otter flattened, <laughs> you know, so they're, they're seriously, they're like that thick and they live in these burrows on the banks of rivers and they don't like the daylight and they don't like people and they don't like noise. So they'll come out of their little burrow and they'll slip straight into the water and they're gone and you won't see them. It, to be able to actually spot a platypus is pretty special. Wow. So I've, I've never been able to find one. There is um, near me, there is a sort of river area where they are supposed to be. And I've staked that out so many nights <laughs> and never been able to find it, which kills me. But I'll, I'll find one one day. Yes, you will. Well, I think all of us have some sort of uh, nemesis species, if you will. And it's, yep. it's a, yeah, that's a challenge. Lev, do you have a nemesis species? Um, I do. I, I have several. Uh, I have several. Um, one, one of the ones um, that I think really stands out for me in terms of mammals is the lynx, the Canada lynx. So I've seen lynx a couple of times, but they've always been very fleeting views, like just the back end running across the road. And uh the past couple of years have been really good for lynx in Northern Ontario. So I've got lots of people, you know, who are out and about and they, you know, they're not necessarily looking for lynx, which I think is the best way to actually find them to not, not go specifically looking for them. And, you know, they, and oftentimes they're so chill, you know, when you find them, they're lying on the road and they get like all these great cell phone pictures and, you know, and then I go up and see nothing. And then like a logger will stop and say, Oh yeah, I got one last week. And, had to stop the truck to let it cross the road and whatever. And it was like, yeah, yeah, I'm great. So a photographic nemesis. Um, there say. you go. So this is, this is a really cool thing. Like you guys say, you know, Australia has got this remarkable wildlife and I know we've got a reputation that we've got these terrifying spiders and, you know, horrifying snakes that will get you. But you guys have like full on apex predators. You've got like bears, you know, and lynx and cougar and wolverines and, you know, you've even got... <laughs> Big like, mammals, yeah. You do. And yeah. Like, we, don't, we don't really have that here. The most dangerous thing we have here that's a mammal is literally the kangaroo. Really? Like those things... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, where, where I used to keep my horse, I used to go riding up there. Part of the park is um, set aside for equestrian use. And it's all hills and you know, lots of kangaroos, wombats, everything. And uh, yeah, I tell you what, you haven't lived until you've been chased by a very angry male kangaroo in late summer. Those things move and they <laughs> are really narky. Like they will, they will have a go at you if they think that you're threatening their females. Right. Or they just feel like chasing you wow <laughs> well that sounds like an unpleasant experience <laughs> yeah it's 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 one of those things it's a it's an australian rite of passage in the bush right and most of the time they'll they'll be fine but just every now and again the boys you know it's like a typical teenage boy you know has to prove himself <laughs> problematic <laughs> sometimes yes <laughs> but the joeys are so cute so, you know, they get away with it. <laughs> we don't we don't have those predators and like when I was in Canada, I actually got to see a okay, how do I say it? Is it coyote or coyote? I think 
I think it's like a tomato tomato. No, nobody really says tomato, but um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I've heard a lot of people use both, both a lot of sort of scientists and, and biologists and whatnot use coyote or coyote. Yeah. Um, I agree with that. I think it's it, however you feel like saying it, Maggie, you, you just go for it. I, well, I saw a coyote. We, we were just, we were just driving along and we we're pulling into this horse farm and I thought it was a dog at first and like you know I've got my friend Morgan in the front she's from Canada she was our guide because you know we can't speak Canadian um, <laughs> <laughs> and she was like showing us around and all that sort of stuff and my husband was driving and I'm in the back seat and I see what I think is this dog and then I realized wait no dogs don't look like that like the, the face is so different you know and I almost came out through the roof of the car <laughs> Yeah, you know, just going, oh my God, coyote. Like, and it was just like a, you know, that naturalist stop when you see something and you tell people to just stop. My <laughs> husband knows that. So he just stopped and here's this coyote and he's just standing there and he just looked at us. And it was like, mind blown. It was, yeah, we just don't have that here. It's fantastic. Well, all right. So I, and Lev has heard me talk about this before, but there's, there's a couple things on this planet that I find really scary. Um, polar bears that he hangs out with on occasion being <laughs> one of those things. And then you have one of the things that I'm truly scared of, which is leopard seals. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're worth being scared of. Yeah. yeah. So uh, while you might not have the terrestrial fear factor at least for me you've got a marine fear factor that is they're, they're not real common though see like they tend to sort of hang around more in the bottom end of tasmania okay so we don't really see them very often for where where i am we get fur seals uh, all right you know so they're they're a little bit cuter you know the 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 babies are they look like little plush toys, you know. And we, if you go out on the bay, into Port Phillip Bay, you can actually find they like hanging out on the buoys. I think you guys say buoys. We say boys. You know, <laughs> they, they like hanging out on them. And uh, I've actually, when I've been scuba diving, the young ones like to come up and sort of, you know, check you out, try to bite the bubbles and occasionally bite the cables on your scuba gear. <laughs> <laughs> Which never ends well. Um, but, you know, they're... they're they're, they're very well respected here. People know if they come up on a beach, leave it alone, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. nice. But they don't tend to come out into the suburbs very often. <laughs> That's probably, <laughs> probably good for best. all parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we appreciate it. <laughs> well, have you gotten to uh, take any recent adventures, Maggie? Uh, so my, well, it's been a little bit hard with COVID. Mm -hmm. so we, we locked down very hard here. We weren't allowed to travel very much. Um, and also I have a, I have a bit of a leg injury, so I can't do the usual sort of scrambling over, you know, too many wild areas. I have to sort of stay to paved. So I've started exploring my local patch right. a little bit more. So, and because, you know, I walk fairly slow and I've got a camera and I've I've discovered mini beasts. Ah. You know, I so I call it, I call it slow naturalism. <laughs> you know, so I don't go by for numbers. I go for cool stuff. So I've been sort of just exploring there. And recently we've been given a little bit more freedom so we can travel a bit further away now and get out of our houses, which is good. And I found a place, um, down on the Mornington Peninsula, which is near where I told you about Hastings. It's a lovely area. It's the sort of natural area where we get a lot of mud flats and okay. sort of shrubby um, tea trees. I'm not sure if you guys have tea trees over there. No. They're like a, like a very scrubby gum tree, I suppose, would be the closest thing, like an acacia almost, but really thick. Okay. Uh, and we, I found a place called, um, oh, what's the name of that park? Warrenjean Park or Warrenjeanie that a lot of our parks are named after Aboriginal names and 
I'm not real good at pronouncing some of them, but it's um, it's actually the southernmost mangroves in the world. Oh wow! And I stumbled across this kind of by accident. I had no idea it was there. I knew there was a park which has lots of pelicans and you know the, your usual sort of seagoing birds, uh, and I just sort of looked on Google Maps because that's my go-to. And they said that there's a boardwalk there. And I'm sort of a little bit obsessed with boardwalks <laughs> and, you know, walking over marshes and things. I just love that. All my friends can tell you, as soon as you show me a boardwalk, I'm gone. That's it. I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Um, and they said there's, you know, about four kilometers of it. So I went down there to this Warrenjean Park and it was phenomenal like the mangroves that grow there are quite different from what I've seen sort of of imagery like in Florida and mm -hmm. all that sort of area but uh, there's I think they said there's like something like 172 species of bird there wow man. um something like 27 species of mammals numerous fish and insect species so I went on a really dull day so the, the best thing about that was there was nobody else there so yeah, as far as I'm concerned, this is it is the best. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Especially in so these times. <laughs> it is. So yeah. as far as I'm concerned, that park is mine. Um, but <laughs> the downside of that, unfortunately, is a lot of the birds were like, "No, I'm I'm staying dry." But I saw one of my favourite little raptors we get here, which is a black-shouldered kite. Ooh. Mm -hmm. They're gorgeous little things we get them everywhere but people don't notice them because they're little you know and they don't really notice them until they start sort of fluttering in doing that hover in midair and then drop like a rock it's brilliant um, but yeah I saw so many swallows and ibis uh, my favorite which is uh, blue herons here and yeah, it was just when I saw a turtle that there's like a little, there's like a stream running through this place mm -hmm. and it's, it's fairly, fairly quick going little stream there. And there was this turtle and it was determined to go up stream <laughs> and it was really not doing all that well. <laughs> and it was fighting the current and I'm just watching this poor little thing. And I'm like, do I get in there and help him or what do I do? But yeah, that was, that was brilliant. Yeah, so I went on this uh, on this boardwalk and husband walked around with me for a little bit and then he sort of, he's a runner. So I think he gets a bit frustrated with my little slow naturalism <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> and it was raining. So he went back to the car and he drove to the other end of the walk, which is, I think it was four and a half kilometers away at the Dolphin Institute, which unfortunately was closed, which drove me nuts because I wanted to go in there. Um, and yeah, I'm just walking along and just the the wildlife there. We have, like the way to describe it, we have the mangroves there and then we have uh, probably about 500 metres worth of bush off to the left and then suburbia starts. Okay. And you'd think that, you know, that might not be conducive to a lot of wildlife. But if there's one thing I will say about its Australian wildlife, it adjusts really well. So there's, uh, I know that there's, ja, um, what, are they, what are they called there? I know that they've got Eastern yellow robins in there, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any, which is a pity. They're, they're cute little things. And they have, uh, they have a couple of species of owl in there as well, including, I believe, powerful owls, which is like our biggest sort of predator mm -hmm. owl. And we, that's, that's, that's again, that's one of them. Oh, they're, they're lovely. Again, one of my unicorn species. Uh, just keep missing them. So, didn't get to see that one either, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, like with the bushfires that we had earlier in the year, we've had uh, we've had a bit of an interesting development. A lot of the birds that we don't normally see down here have started coming down because there's no food for them, unfortunately. And would someone's been reporting uh, sightings of um, glossy black cockatoos. Ooh. And these are stunning cockatoos. They're not as big as the white ones, I don't think. I think they're a little bit smaller. But normally, if you wanted to see one of these things, you have to go way out 
into uh, what's called the Gippsland region, which is very sort of rural, you know, not the easiest thing to get to. Um, so, and he has been reported sort of in that area as well. So I looked around, but didn't find it. Did find yellow-tailed black cockatoos. Oh, neat. Which are my favourite kind of cockatoo. So they're, they're a little bit more... A little bit more sophisticated than the white ones. <laughs> I think it's the best way to say it. Are they it's also, kind of, um, are they as yelly as the white cockatoos? They, they can be, but the, the coolest thing about them, they're, they're a fair bit bigger than the white ones as well. And um, not as common, nowhere near as common. But the cool thing about them is their call when they when they fly overhead, they've got this really sort of, almost melancholy sort of cry. Hmm. It's, a, it's a really distinct, gorgeous call. And you can always tell the birders whenever one of them flies over because everyone just freezes and whips around and looking for them. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's quite a different sound than the white cockatoos, which again, I just, you know, your typical sort of, you know, G'day, I'm a cockatoo, I'm screaming, <laughs> you know, hello everyone. Whereas the black cockatoo is like, hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's quite gorgeous. They're they're really hard to get close to as well. So you that learn to hide like behind you. trees and sort of huddle up on them. Noir. Yeah, it was. It was really beautiful. It was um really nice actually seeing ibis just in their natural habitat. So um I don't know if you guys heard about it, but we Ibis have sort of invaded our suburbs and cities, and they call them bin chickens. Bin chickens. <laughs> that's, that's right. yeah. Oh, I've seen the videos. So. <laughs> yeah. And it really upsets me because, like, I'm used to seeing them in wetlands, you know, and it's, I'm like, I'm, I'm on a one woman campaign to claim back the name Ibis. You know, it's <laughs> not a bin chicken. <laughs> but yeah, seeing them just roaming around on the marshes and the, the in the mangroves and hunting crays and all that sort of good stuff, frogs and all the other things that they find in there was really nice. I, I know it's a really common bird, but, you know, it's it was just nice seeing them be where they need to be. Our, yeah. our white ibis here in Florida um, is kind of suburbanizing. It's becoming a French fry bird. <laughs> and and it, it is, it's always striking because they're not quite at the bin chicken state yet, but they are, they're definitely becoming more abundant and kind of overlooked, right? And so I, I know the sensation of, of going out and seeing them where they, in, the, in natural Florida, and just really appreciating in the moment their beauty, because they really are a gorgeous thing in their mm. environment and it's it's easy to kind of dismiss them as french fry birds but um yeah i know what you're talking about yeah that, so we, that was really nice we have the same sort of thing <clears throat> especially in winter but with bald eagles because they they are they can be a, a quote-unquote french fry bird not that they really? eat french fries but they do they do in the winter especially around dumps like waste disposal sites and around uh, coastal communities, like cottaging communities and anywhere where there's fish, like fish being gutted on a commercial basis or just people with docks, like you will see starting from probably November on throughout the winter, large aggregations of bald eagles, like especially at the dump, like that's where everybody goes to photograph them. Like if you go just to the dump, there's all these gulls and there's like some of the famous dumps, like there's this one called um, the Merrick landfill up in North Bay, which is from here in Toronto, it's about three and a half hours, give or take, directly north. Uh, but in the winter, you could see like 40, 50 bald eagles there. Wow. The Lev, you're, you're breaking my heart here, they, man. This is not the image quit. I've got of golden eagles. <laughs> well, bald eagles, bald eagles. Bald the, eagles, sorry. Golden eagles are a bit more classy. Like every okay. once in a while, you see a golden eagle at a dump. But um, for the most part, they tend to be fairly solitary and they tend to kind of uh, distance themselves from people but bald eagles yeah and like the further north and west you go it's just yeah like there's this great video that's on youtube i think it may be from alaska and it's just like a pickup truck full of fish guts 
and this guy just parks it at a, at a local pier or whatever and there's all these bald eagles that come and just start eating I mean, you know it's a busy pier and yeah they're like gulls they're like gulls so yeah when you see them in the wild you know sitting on a, a tree in the distance along a beautiful lo- northern lake it's yeah it's like very idyllic versus yeah, that- the, win- the winter imagery you know I might keep that image if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have a couple well, of eagles down there too, don't you, Maggie? Yeah, yeah, we do. We have some, um, we have white-bellied sea eagles. Magnificent. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really cool. I really like them. They're, um, they're really easy to find, actually. Oh, there's yeah? A, yeah, there's a place down here um, called the Western Treatment Plant which is again on the other side of the bay to me. So I tend to do a lot of driving uh, and that's like a bird as paradise. It's actually a Ramsar site. What does that mean? uh, Ramsar. So it's a, um, it's a, it's like a world recognized heritage Ah. and wildlife place. Uh, I can't remember the exact meaning or of the acronym, but it's like an outstanding area for natural conservation. And we have, Man, if you like birds, this is the place you got to go. Hmm. This, it's it's phenomenal. You go sort of about November, and you'll get the the white-bellied sea eagles. You'll get millions of shorebirds that are migrating, millions of them. Uh, we get everything there, and we get a lot of wedge-tailed eagles as well, and rails and everything. It's it's a pretty phenomenal place. Like for like Melbourne, where I live, it's a big city and we're, we're very sprawl, but we're very fortunate. We've got a lot of these natural areas left. So, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, it's literally a treatment plant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. and you think, oh, no, nah, that'd be horrible. But there's, there's two sections to it. There's the part where it's quite dangerous to go where you need a special permit. Um, which is really frustrating because that's often where the brolgas nest. So oh. it's mm, brolgas yeah. are under a crane, right? <laughs> yeah, I think they fall under a crane. They're very large, very big birds. Uh, I've been lucky enough. Sometimes they come into the other section, which is like the treatment ponds, where the water's almost good to go. Yeah, so it's just like massive wetlands, and the diversity of wildlife there is. It blows my mind and it blows up my digital camera cards. I go through so many cards in there because just get everything, you know. Um, you can get everything from, you know, these stunning, beautiful birds to the occasional snake just to keep you alive and awake. And, <laughs> you know, you know, don't stick your hand under there. It's not a frog you're seeing. It's a snake. Um, learned that one. But yeah, it's yeah. Some of the eagles we get around here, the wedge tails, they they come over the suburbs pretty often. No, oh, wow. we, we yeah, it's not too hard to find. Like you know, you have to know what you're looking for. They tend to stay quite high. Oh, okay. okay. So it's it's not a simple case of going, oh hey, there's a wedgie. It's you know like oh, that might be a wedge tail <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah, that's our experience with golden eagles here yeah oh, okay During migration yeah they're really high yeah they don't they don't often come down yeah. i sort of envy you guys with migrations because we we do have migratory species here but it's nothing like what you guys have you know lev i see on your facebook you know the the pictures of all the various little birds and things yeah that you get the here. warblers and stuff yeah we have a very pronounced migration yeah yeah Which, we don't really yeah. have that we have a few, like we get the rainbow bee eaters and uh, a few shorebirds, but we don't really tend to have those kind of set migrations to sort of anticipate. Right. Yeah, it's more like a resource-based movement, I guess. Like Very much so. Water, yeah. Extremely. Cool. Actually, I saw an interesting article, I think it was yesterday, um, now that we're on the topic of shorebirds in Australia. And there was a Far Eastern curlew that had a GPS unit, um, a telemetry unit that was attached to it. And I think recently it took off from Australia. It was a young bird. I think it was two or three years old. And it 
did a 10 day nonstop flight over oh, mostly yeah. open water. It, it went over Papua, like it went over New Guinea, um, but it didn't stop. And it landed uh, in Shanghai in China recently on the big mud flat that a lot of shorebirds use there. But yeah, that was remarkable because it was, uh, I think it's one of the first times where like a complete route for Far Eastern Curlew was um, sort of laid out through telemetry and it was it was remarkable yeah it was like a 10 day haul wow. <laughs> without the bird stopping so where do yeah. they breed though so far eastern curlews i think most of them breed in siberia yeah okay. i don't think they might breed in northern china but i don't think they do i think they go i think they're coastal like i think they go to siberia to breed most of them yeah, but this individual, I th I don't think it's gonna breed. I think it's done, like it's up there. It feeds. I think it'll just feed in the mud flat, and it's gonna be a non-breeder because I think it's a bit late now. Okay. For it to to go up, but I think young birds will do that. Like they'll go, um, they'll summer on the the flat there. It's like a huge, like it's it goes on for like fifteen twenty kilometers. Um, yeah, I, I was there uh, in October last year. Yeah, uh, the spoonbilled sandpipers use it. Uh, as well that's sort of the the most famous denizen um of that of the mud flat there but uh but yeah yeah so it's there it's probably just going to spend the summer there and come back so cool cool yeah oh shorebirds are amazing yeah what they can pull off um like did it drink like did it drink fresh water who, who knows <laughs> maybe when it rained that's, that's the water yeah, came down maybe yeah, that's the most logical it. thing that i see yeah but what if it doesn't rain you know on its passage yeah Does it just not drink <laughs> yeah i don't know something like through clouds with your mouth open <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> that'll work that'll work yeah so what's going no, on so in canada left well um we are in we're approaching sort of the height of summer so it's hot, uh, it's very muggy, um, and it's not, it's quite quiet. Like the birds have started to breed. Uh, most of them have nests with eggs or young now on them. Uh, I kept track, like there's this little wood lot that's nearby my place where I did some migration stuff in the spring. So I went there a few times. It's sort of the core 30, 40 species now that are gonna stay until August basically when new things will come in but yeah like I found a few nests uh rose-breasted grosbeak red start um, and yellow warbler and stuff like that and uh yeah I thought that was nice and then two days ago I went back to check and they oh, every single nest had cowbird, <laughs> cowbird eggs in it wow like, all right uh, but I like cowbirds so it was um you know, it was just interesting to see it's it's an area it's very close to a large agricultural and big urban areas so the population of cowbirds is probably artificially high um so yeah it was just interesting to see how many nests are parasitized um otherwise yeah it's 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 the same as uh, as about the last time we've chatted. Um, yeah, I think it's going to get to 40 today with the Humidex, 40 <laughs> centigrade, uh, which is not normal for June. And uh, actually, we had uh, a big thunderstorm twice this week, which again is not typical June for here. That's mostly sort of July, August monsoon type stuff. But um, yeah, I have a few friends in Mexico and they're really feeling like in central Mexico, they're really feeling like these big monsoons starting already uh, a little bit early. Um, but yeah, no, that's, um, that's basically the gist of it. We had a uh, tornado come through Orlando. Oh, okay. Like, and how common is that in Orlando? Uh, not very. And yeah, I didn't think so. This one was within about a quarter mile of my house. Wow. That's, uh, okay. Yeah. So it was, it was an interesting event, um, you, you know, in keeping with the rest of 2020. Yeah. Um, but it went across this lake. And so <laughs> immediately after the tornado, we went out looking to see what the tornado had done. And I was looking in the, in essentially the gutters of the street 
looking for <laughs> to see if any fish had gotten picked up and thrown <laughs> out of the lake. <laughs> <laughs> and um, didn't find any. And then I started feeling bad because there was an obvious human cost. Um, not so much of life, but of, of property and damage and people right. were really upset. So I decided it was not appropriate to just be checking for displaced fish um, at that time. But <laughs> yeah, it's one of these things, you know, like you for like the storm birding, right? Like you're, you're looking at it come, you're like, yeah, I want things to come and I want to get a sooty turn or whatever. But then you have to think like, yeah, it's not good for the bird. It's not good for the people. So it's kind of a, yeah. Yeah. Doubly so for fish if they end up in a street. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Does that happen often? See, like the stuff get thrown like the fish yeah it is, okay i've never heard of that before that's pretty neat there's actually a great book it's called it's raining frogs and fishes and it talks okay. about kind of natural weather phenomena and that that actually does happen with some frequency so fish will get taken up by a water spout or a tornado and um depending on where they're coming from they can serve and depending on the fish they can survive for reasonably long amounts of time uh, wow. because they're kept quite wet as you can imagine yeah yeah uh, and then so sometimes you'll get you'll get uh falls of fish miles from any water and they'll be they'll appear perfectly well well i mean having suffered a dramatic fall from the clouds but right still moving yeah um, wow and so that's taken on uh, uh i think religious meanings to many people yes yeah yeah you definitely see that on the news <laughs> a lot fish birds yeah the other thing that's exciting is that the podcast or the cast is um we're starting something new Hi, my name is David Shaw. I am a professional photographer, um, but I'm also a wildlife biologist. I have both master's and undergraduate degrees in wildlife biology. I studied birds for a lot of my professional career as a biologist, uh, but I switched to becoming a photographer. And rather than that changing how I work, it's just sort of shifted my direction. So I now try to tell the stories of wild places and wild creatures through images and writing um, instead of through data, as I once did. Now, here at The Naturalists, we sort of fall somewhere between those two things. We try to tell the stories of natural history, wild animals, wild places, um, through our encounters with them in the field. And we've been trying to come up with a great way to engage people and to more effectively get people to tell those stories that are not often heard. And so we've come up with the idea of a photography contest. So in collaboration with Cena Kean and some of the other folks who are uh, active participants here on The Naturalists, uh, we've decided that this would be a, a fun thing to do and hopefully engage some people in the progress. So these will hopefully be monthly as we move forward. Uh, I will be one of the judges. I imagine we'll have some other people, more, maybe some more serious biologists engaged in the judging of each image. Um, and it's mostly for recognition and for fun and to make ourselves creative in how we're telling the stories of wild animals and wild places. So assignment number one for this coming month. I want us to create images with stories of how animals behave and engage with their environment. So think about stories of predation. Think about uh, carnivory. Think about habitat. Um, these are the things that we're going to be looking for in the first month's images. So here is an image of a pack of African wild dogs that I encountered in Botswana uh, after they have just devoured and now are now playing with the head of an impala that they killed. Other examples can be behavioral. So here is an image of a humpback whale in Kenai Fjords National Park doing what's called a tail wave. And that image um, is a clear example of a unique behavior that happens on the northern wintering grounds in Alaska. 
So think about those kinds of things, those sorts of images that you might have in your collection or that you can go out and create that will tell these stories. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to uh, submit. Um, we'll be using the hashtag naturalist images number one. And you can share those images on Facebook directly into the Naturalists group or on Instagram using that hashtag. And I will be checking them, sharing them around to the other people in the group. And then there will be, a, you know, some prize and some recognition for the winners for each month. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I think it's going to be fun. Um, please, you don't have to be a professional photographer. You don't have to have the best equipment. A phone shot can sometimes tell the most compelling images. It all means you just have to be out there seeing it and recording it and photographing it. So thanks, everybody. I look forward to seeing what you're creating. And yeah, thanks a bunch. Another thing that's going on is Black Birders Week. Um, which has been a huge moment for our community uh, and really finally giving the recognition to some amazing folks out there in the natural history community and natural hi history world that haven't gotten it before. Um, yes. Yeah, no, racial inequality is certainly something that exists in birding. There's a lot of people um, that I just through birding groups and, and things like that, um, that have been happening and conversations that have been happening. Um, there's a lot of people that don't think that that is the case in birding, which is a fairly, you know, it's a fairly quote unquote innocent hobby, but it certainly does exist. We've seen it uh, recently um, in Christian Cooper's case in Central Park. And a lot of people have been coming out and describing their own experiences um, regarding racial inequality in birding. And it's an important topic to discuss. And now is the time to discuss it. So one of the sort of best resources that's just come up um, is this great initiative called Black Birders Week that uh, C has, uh, has mentioned earlier. Uh, Karina, who we had an interview with, uh, was largely responsible for a good chunk of it. And uh, yeah, we're going to provide a link. Um, and that uh, it will be a whole lot of material for those who might not necessarily, well, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just a great load of material for folks to, to listen to, you know, the voices of black and people of color have not been heard very often in the birding communities. And this is uh, an opportunity uh, to do that. So it's very important um, for people to get that out there and uh, to use that resource and continue to fight uh, against racial inequality um, in birding and elsewhere. Because if you do nothing, um, then that is part of the problem. Maggie, are you seeing um, Black Birders Week and, and other elements where you are? Not so much Black Birders Week, but it certainly triggered off uh, a lot of recognition of our own problems here, specifically in how uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait people are treated. So... You know, it's uh, horrific events that triggered it. But if there can be any good said to come of it, is that it's brought that to light. And in the world of social media, there's no reason for anyone to be uneducated or bury their head in the sand about what's happening. And it needs to be fixed. And here in Australia, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have always been renowned as having deep, deep connections to the land. They are the original naturalists here. There's no denying it. So they're our community and we need to support them. So Maggie, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and tell us about your, your patch and um, what you're up to as, as winter sets in for you. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. And if people wanted to find and follow your adventures, where could they do that? 
So I have a Flickr account. If you look up Maggie's Lens, so Maggie's underscore Lens, because of course, why not? Um, so all most of my photography is on there. Um, I post most of my macro photography and some birds when I manage to actually get them. And uh, there'll be a, there'll be a lot of echidna photos on there and kangaroos and all your typical stuff, but no platypus. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> And Lev, where can people find you? Uh, the easiest place to find me is Facebook. Um, I have a public Facebook account that anybody could add. Um, it doesn't have any weird personal stuff on it. It just has pictures of birds as well as uh, any tours and things that I'm leading. Uh, so that's just on Facebook. It's my name, Lev Frid, L-E-V-F-R-I-D. And also, if you're interested in going on a tour with Rock Jumper, which is the company that I work for, um, you can find me, my profile, and that of my colleagues at rockjumperbirding.com. That's a site that's very easy to navigate. And um, yeah, that's where you'll find me. Well, just want to say thank you once again for joining us on The Naturalists, and hopefully we will see you soon. Go out and have great adventures. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.